Hello, everyone, and welcome to Under Attack, a report on cybercrime and healthcare. I am Kristen Hinsberger, the Senior Program and Events Manager at ESET North America. Please note this is a live presentation. It is being recorded and will be available following the conclusion of the webcast. For more information on this topic, including a link to ESET's corporate blog, please check out the Attachments tab. Also, if you have questions for the presenter during the webcast, you can submit them through the Bright Talk question tab at the top and we will address them during the Q&A sessions. Presenting today's webcast is ESET Senior Security Researcher Stephen Cobb and Dr. Larry Ponman. Stephen Cobb has been a CISSP since 1996 and has helped communities large and small to manage their information security with a focus on emerging threats and data privacy issues. The author of several books and hundreds of articles on information assurance, Cobb is part of the research team at ESET North America based in San Diego. Joining Stephen will be Dr. Larry Poneman, and he is the chairman and founder of the Poneman Institute, a research think tank dedicated to advancing privacy, data protection, and information security practices. Dr. Poneman is considered a pioneer in privacy auditing and is the Responsible Information Management, or RIM, framework. Security Magazine has named Dr. Poneman as one of the most influential, influential people for security. With that, I'd like to welcome them both to the webcast, and I'm going to pass it over to Stephen first. Welcome. Thank you uh, very much, Kristen, and uh, good to be here with you online, Larry. Uh, I think this is, this is a very interesting uh, research topic we have here to cover. Uh, the, what we're going to start out with, though, is a poll question. Uh, and this is for the people out there online, and, and welcome, for appreciate you joining us. Uh, just to let you know, you can use your Bright Talk window to vote on this, and Kristen is going to open up the voting. A um, couple of things to mention, since we're, since we're, we're both of us uh, into privacy, we don't track who votes on this, so we don't know who you are, and, and we don't know who's answering yes or no. But if you could answer this question uh, in terms of the organization that you work for, uh, basically, have you ever experienced at your organization a data breach? And um, there's a voting tab at the top. Yeah, oh, a lot of you have found that. I will take a look at um, the results as they come in. I'll give you a couple of, of minutes to vote here. So has your organization ever experienced a data breach? If you don't work for an organization, um, maybe you could answer for yourself. Um, okay. Interesting. Okay, we have we have uh, almost 100 votes here. Um, so let's see. We have some of you obviously are not not keen on voting on this topic. Uh, I'll I'll give you the results then. So so far, um, it is in fact almost exactly one third say yes, two thirds say no. Very interesting. So. Um, a third of the people online have experienced a data breach. Their organization has experienced a data breach. Another interesting statistic there, Larry, and I'll, uh, I'll advance it to the next slide and turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Stephen. It's a pleasure co-presenting with you. And audience, you don't have to take notes because there's a really nice research report associated with our presentation today. And we will tell you how to get a copy of that, uh, that nice little paper. I'm not sure how little it is. It's pretty thick. So sit back and relax, and I'll be the research wonk. If you know who I am, I love research. I sometimes go a little too deep into the details. So if that happens, Stephen, just interrupt me and say, let's move on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but when we talk about today's study, we're really talking about 535 wonderful people that completed the survey successfully. And in order to get to the 535, we basically had a sampling frame of well over 15,000 people who are in the healthcare field or community. Uh, most of these people are in IT. Uh, actually, all of these people are in IT, and many are IT dedicated to IT security. Uh, when you read the paper, we'll, it explains all of the organizational characteristics and demographics of the sample. Uh, and if you're a participant uh, in a Poneman study and you're listening right now, I want to say thank you for doing it. We can't do what we did without your a wonderful uh, work in uh, taking our survey, so thank you. With that being said, by the way, that's a really cool cover, Stephen. That's a cover of the report. <laughs> <I made> that, <laughs> that is. Okay. 
So let's let's talk a little bit about concerns. And what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about it, and then I'll turn it over to you, Stephen, for the color commentary, because you're really the of, of the team. The uh, you are definitely the domain expert. So what are wow, some wow. of the big concerns? <laughs> In fact, Stephen, let's start with a little question here. Uh, there are four concerns, and it's under the heading the healthcare industry is under pressure, <laughs> and the pressure includes. Of course, controlling costs, adopting new enabling technologies, and some of these technologies are disruptive to the healthcare uh, field. Uh, digitizing patient information, the move from paper to electronic health records, and then the need to constantly streamline and improve operations. And these three pressure or four pressure points basically lead to potentially undesirable behavior. What's your read? Have you worked in the healthcare industry, Stephen? What, what do you what do you think? Well, I, I think, first of all, I, I need to express extreme uh, sympathy to, to people in healthcare uh, and healthcare IT in particular, because this is a lot of pressure. And, and, and really, in some ways, I, I'd say it's unprecedented that we had this huge push to digitize patient information that coincided, uh, and, and you know, just through um, an accident of history in a way, with the massive growth of cybercrime as really uh, an industry. And so, you know, it, it's not just the, the problems which are, are significant in, in digitizing health information and, and going digital as, as a doctor. I, 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 I'm not sure if you've read um, The Digital Doctor by Robert Wachter, who's um, uh, the chair at, um, of medicine at uh, UCSF. But that's a fascinating look into, you know, just how much change this means within the doctor's office, and then you, you fold in, as we'll see in these, these results, the, the impact of, of cybercrime, and it, it really is a tough situation to be in. So, so yeah, uh, a lot of pressures from different directions, and, and I think those are reflected in, in some of the results that we see. So uh, I'll turn it back to you. That's great. What was the name of that book? I wanted to take notes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Digital Doctor. I mean, all you have to do is put Digital Doctor in Google and you, you'll find it. It is it, it's a very interesting insight into it, into the issues. Great. I love it. I'll, I, the title sounds great. I'm definitely going to get a copy. Okay, so here's some uh, drum roll here, some research results from our latest and greatest study. Um, of organizations, 54% uh, of organizations in our study experienced a cyber attack in the last 12 months. Now, cyber attack is a term that unfortunately is used extensively in our community, in the security community, but it means different things to different people. Sometimes it's an exploit, sometimes it's a compromise, sometimes it's a full-fledged attack. Uh, so basically, uh, we define the concept of cyber attack in the survey for framing purposes so we can maintain consistency across our sample. But 54% said they had one of these, one or more of these events in the last year. 48% of organizations have experienced an incident involving the loss or exposure of patient information. Keep in mind that not all data breaches in healthcare, or generally speaking, are, are the result of bad guys doing bad things. Sometimes it's good people making mistakes. We say good people do stupid things, and unfortunately that might be happening here as well, but that's 48%. Um, and if you look at the numbers and kind of did a little extrapolation, Healthcare organizations experience at least one cyber attack a month on average. And sometimes these things bounce off our firewall, but sometimes they get through in the infiltrated network and enterprise system, and we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, that's why the, so many of the headlines around data breaches concern healthcare organizations recently. Uh, Stephen, what's your interpretation of some of these results? Yeah, so I think, to me, actually, what was exciting about this and, and, and to give some background, I, I think I've read every um, cybersecurity survey there is out there, um, is that this is actually an interesting sample that, that, that you looked at. You know, uh, I think I'm, not, I'm correct in saying 535 is a pretty large sample. And also, the, the, the way we bracketed this, it's, it's mainly organizations under 500 uh, employees. So what this tells me is that, you know, it's not just the mega health uh, care organizations that are under attack. I mean, last year, you know, we saw over 100 uh, million records exposed by um, breaches at large health-related organizations like, uh, um, uh, you know, Blue Cross organizations. 
but this is th these are these are you know kind of in the trenches organizations in healthcare some of them quite small and and yet these numbers show that the the attack is uh, the attacks are ongoing, uh, they're frequent, and, uh, and, and you know, the 48% number, uh, that's almost half of, of all of the organizations that, that uh, you, you queried had had some loss or exposure of patient information. It, it, it's very concerning, and, you know, not every exposure is, is criminals, um, but, but any exposure, uh, I think, is, is, is harmful, certainly to the, the trust that we feel in our organizations, you know, it's very important for healthcare organizations to have all the information, for your doctor to have all the information they need to, to do a proper diagnosis and treatment. And if people are withholding information because they're worried it's going to be exposed, that's not good. So um, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Larry. Okay, so we're going to go to our next slide here. Um, so what's increasing patient data vulnerability? Well, I think what's very interesting, 52% said using legacy systems. And the reason is a lot of these systems are homegrown and they've kind of developed over time. And as a result of that, sometimes there's interoperability and scalability problems. At least I've seen that in healthcare. So legacy systems, again, not to say all legacy systems are bad, but sometimes they create all sorts of problems. And then just general technology trends, like, for example, migration to the cloud, the use of mobile devices in the workplace access to big data files and the use of big data for analytics. And even the Internet of Things, you know, this, the refrigerator in your home talks to your doctor and says, why does Larry have too much chocolate cake in the refrigerator if he's supposed to be on the diet? The day that that comes, by the way, I'm leaving. I'm moving to New Zealand. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so any, any comments on this slide? Yes, yeah, so you know, I think... I, I'm with you, although I, I probably wouldn't move to New Zealand because New Zealand's the only other country in the world that allows uh, pharmaceutical adverts on television. But um, no, I, I, I love I love the graphic that uh, that our people came up with here for the legacy systems with the cobweb. Um, I, I, I actually this was to me one of the most interesting results because it's it's kind of a rock and a hard place. Although the, the you know we have a cloud symbol for. Uh, which is, you know, we think of clouds as soft, but it, it's a hard, hard problem we have here. That again, and it goes to the, the the pressure that healthcare organizations are under. It's very difficult to upgrade some of these legacy systems and and to get them out of service. Uh, the problem is that you know certainly with Windows XP, it's not supported anymore uh, by Microsoft. Um, there are, I'd have to say, ESET as a security vendor supports. Um, <clears throat> Windows XP still, but you know we certainly encourage people to move away from it if they can. But it's very difficult, particularly you know if it's if it's a system that's uh, been certified using old software and has to get recertified to be upgraded. So you've got that problem, um, and and I think you know as we'll see in some of the other uh, studies, you know patching those systems is a big problem. Uh, as well, then we have this rollout of the Internet of Things, which which range from uh, fairly sophisticated medical devices all the way through to the thing that that I've got on my wrist right now, which is is tracking how long I sit here and telling me to get up and move. Um, you know, the fitness trackers are, are actually being enrolled in health uh, programs and wellness programs, and we've already seen in in a number of instances that, that the security of those devices is not where it should be. Um, you know, I, I think that that creates uh, what I would call an increase in the attack surface uh, for the people who want to get at this data for malicious purposes. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it, this is a perfect num set of numbers to show it, it's half of one and it's, it's half of the other uh, in terms of the most, um, most challenging uh, aspects of the current situation. Uh, Larry? No, thank you. So what are organizations most concerned about? Um, the, the, on the actual survey, I think we had kind of a pretty long laundry list that people could select. And number one is system failure, unsecure medical devices, cyber attacks, just generally speaking, employee-owned mobile devices, BYOD, causing trouble and problems, and identity thieves. You know, basically medical identity theft is a big problem and a crime that's growing pretty quickly. 
Uh, at the Institute, we've done five or six years of studies around identity, medical identity theft as a crime. And in the black market for information, I know you know this, Stephen, the value of a, a medical record is made as, viewed as much more valuable and there's more revenue opportunities for the bad guy uh, than, say, credit card information or even login credentials. So it's a big issue out there. But in terms of system failure, you know, again, uh, story after story, just recently a, a health care provider was hit with ransomware, and as a result they basically weren't able to provide services to patients. So the consequences can be very, very serious in the healthcare field. Any comments even on this uh, on this slide? Yes, well, I think, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, you know, in the report, people can see the, the exact numbers for these. But, you know, system failure coming out, uh, number one, was, was I think, a, a stark reminder that systems are, you know, system reliability, availability is critical in healthcare. And, I, I, you know, in some ways it's not surprising that that's the number one concern. And it, it's kind of encouraging in a way that people see that as an overarching concern. Um, the unsecured medical devices, though, was was uh, kind of a surprise to me that that, that is is getting close to top of mind, um, and and I think it reflects this to a certain extent this this move towards the use of more devices, telemedicine, um, you know, uh, fitness devices, uh, and so on, um, and and also the reports of you know these devices being uh, attacked and in some cases hacked. Uh, as far as the identity issue is concerned, I think. You know, something that I find talking to people in, in health IT is some difficulty understanding, well, why do people want medical records? Because actual medical fraud is a kind of a niche market for a criminal. Um, and, and it's important to remember that one of the reasons that people are stealing medical records is not necessarily for medical fraud, but just because it's a rich source of identity information that I can use for um, I can use for tax identity theft, I can use it for loan scams, I can use it for mortgage fraud, I can use it for a wide range of fraud. Um, and so it, it's, it's a rich piece of information, a medical record, and as, as you rightly point out, Larry, uh, it goes for a lot of money on the black market, and that uh, certainly, I think, is driving a fair amount of cybercrime out there. Uh, and, and yeah, one, one thing we didn't ask about specifically in, in the, the study was ransomware, but I, I think you know, this is this is something which is has kind of plunged into the healthcare area, um, and and does impact system uh, uh, availability, and uh, and we can talk a bit more about that later. So, uh, back to you, Larry. Thank you, Stephen. So here are some data points. We asked our respondents what are the the uh, top three ways, if you will, that organizations are attacked. And the number one is exploit of existing software vulnerability that's old, that's three months old, web-borne malware attacks, and exploit of existing software vulnerabilities that's rel uh, less than three months old. So clearly, some things out there, you know, you have a patch, but you forget to update it, or it doesn't, you know, you're 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 too busy to take a, something offline off of production. But basically, it seems like um, known vulnerabilities, things that are known for at least three months is our number one way we are attacked in the healthcare field. Any surprises here, Stephen? <clears throat> well, no, actually. I, I think, um, you know, in, the, in this sense uh, or in, in, in this aspect of, of the security uh, defenses, I see this in other sectors, you know, that, that it, it seems to be, you know, a, a sort of a, a global issue. It, and, and, you know, it's important to point out that these are these are not zero day attacks. These are not brand new vulnerabilities that are being exploited. Um, and, and interesting, you know, we we actually had 70% say, well, is exploiting uh, f the fresher vulnerabilities. But 80, almost 80%, you know, uh, of these attacks coming in through uh, things which, you know, really by three months out should be patched. And and again. I have a lot of sympathy for the IT folks who have to deal with patching because, you know, you can't just uh, update right away. You, you, in some cases, you've got to do a fair amount of testing to make sure that, you know, the patches don't break uh, current systems. And, and, you know, and this, this actually may be a, a particular challenge in, in healthcare, you know, because of that, 
you know, need for five nines availability or ten. <laughs> I don't know how many nines right. would actually be. A, uh, uh, you know, if I'm on the operating table and you're using a robot to operate on me, I'm, I'm going to want more than five nines probably in terms of uh, availability. But, you know, it, it's, it's a definite challenge there to um, get the patches out, make sure that they don't break anything, uh, and, and keep up with that. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's not surprising that it's a challenge, but uh, there's certainly um, it needs a lot of attention. And, and, you know, the 75% in terms of web-borne malware attacks, uh, again, that reflects, I think, you know, these uh, crime schemes which are using infected websites to, to um, right. infect uh, and compromise machines when they visit, uh, whether people are going there um, just through regular browsing, through poison search results, or through links in uh, bogus email. You know, it, it's, the web is definitely, and it, you know, it tells us we we need to do a better job of, of screening out um, these malicious uh, web activities. So, uh, back to you, Larry. Oh, thank you very much, Stephen. Love your commentary, by the way. It's really neat. Okay, oh, so now we're changing the field, and we're going to talk about implications and costs. Okay, implications and costs. But before we do that, guess what? We have another poll question. I'll turn it back over to you, Stephen. Okay, so uh, this one here is what type of attacks, types of attacks are you most concerned about? This is not what have you actually experienced necessarily, but what, what's most concerning? We, you know, there are so many different types of attacks. We, we, we try to give a, a decent grouping here. Number one, uh, and Kristen has already opened the voting if you want to use the, the tab in Bright Talk to vote. Uh, malware and phishing attacks, advanced persistent threats, APTs, uh, denial of service, distributed denial of service attacks, uh, which which were um, we'll talk about in a moment, insider threats or uh, ransomware. And um, as I mentioned before, we can't see you when you vote, so this is anonymous voting. So please uh, go ahead and vote, uh, and I'll share in a moment the results with everybody. Um, we can't see who you are when you answer this. Uh, also, I'll make a note, if you're watching this in the recorded version, uh, you can't vote in the recorded version. Um, so the, that's one thing you miss if you, you wait and watch the recording. So, okay, let me take a look at the voting here. Um, and I just stopped the voting on that. So, um, wow, malware and phishing uh, is 27%, but and I, I'm not surprised by this, Larry, 38% said ransomware. This has, has just really um, broken onto the, the scene here in the last couple of months. Uh, so ransomware at 38% was the top concern. Malware and phishing attacks, which can include now uh, ransomware in a way. Um, much less concern about APTs and de distributed denial of service attacks. 22% said insider threats, and I, I think that's very telling as well. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, Larry, some insider threats are not intentional, uh, but an insider you know, with, with Privileges on the system can do uh, a lot of damage. So um, I advance it to the next slide and, and back to you, Larry. That's great. It's, it is kind of interesting just on the insider threat issue. In healthcare, based on some of our research, we know that a lot of senior level management look at that as a low risk because they want to believe their employees are not committing crimes or have malice, you know, that if there is something that happens, it's carelessness or negligence. Uh, and there's always that, that that look of shock and horror when they realize a trusted employee with privileges up to the zoo, basically they're yeah. involved in some kind of a nefarious activity. So it is a problem. And here's an interesting slide. In. Stephen, can you help help with this one? I think this is your data point. Yes. So um, in in some of the places where I've written up these results, and and um, there's a blog post at eset.com uh, on this. Um, the, the, to try and put in, in perspective the concern uh, about attacks on health uh, IT systems, um, you know, I looked at uh, a number of places that have uh, studied this, and, and essentially what we find is that people are concerned, and the level of concern, interestingly, increases with age. Um, but it, it, it's an 
kind of an, an angle that, that is sometimes missed when we talk, you know, about security in terms of, okay, what's the financial impact? Um, you know, what's the, uh, what's the cost of protecting against it? You know, there is, I believe, a, a, an erosion effect uh, if we don't get a handle on um, data breaches and security in healthcare because, you know, patients will uh, withhold information uh, and they will lose trust. You know, I, I use a, an online um, healthcare portal, uh, which my provider has. I find it very, very useful. Um, but, you know, if people are, are worried uh, about breaches and don't use that, then we lose the benefits of the technology, which I know is something that, that you've looked at in, in other studies, Larry. So, um, but let, let's move on. Uh, I'll advance the slide here to um, this yeah, one. This uh, so go ahead, Larry. Yeah, so we asked the question, what is the, and we use an extrapolation method, um, which from the survey results, we basically infer a specific cost. So. Uh, there are different ways of getting cost data. I don't want to get people confused, but sometimes uh, the only way to get the cost data is to actually do, you know, to visit companies and use a field-based research method like we do with our cost of data breach study. But despite the poo-poo I just gave to the audience, it's this, it does suggest that even smaller-sized healthcare organizations are incurring or perceived to be incurring some very large costs. 32% said more than $250,000 on average. 26% um, said, uh, let's say, uh, up to 250000 then 26% said more than 250000 8% said zero, and those are the people that were probably drinking or, or drinking too much alcohol when they were doing the survey. And then there's a cannot estimate group, and these people just cannot estimate, so you can't force them. But uh, so it's, you know, suggests that it could be a pretty price, uh, pretty costly uh, issue for smaller size healthcare organizations. Any comments on this, Stephen? Yeah, so, so I, I, I found this interesting uh, because, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this is not necessarily the mega healthcare organizations, you know, the Anthem right. and, the, and the massive hospital systems. And so these, you know, these are significant costs, obviously unbudgeted costs. To, cer to a certain extent, um, it is possible to insure against uh, the, some of these costs through cyber risk insurance. Um, but cyber risk insurance is not cheap and, and um, it comes with its own uh, requirements. So, you, you know, you, you can't have poor security go out and get a really good cyber risk insurance policy. Uh, the, the insurance company is not going to go for that. And, and I think the 34% um, you know, that, that cannot estimate is, is very indicative of, of you know, what a problematic area this is. I think in the report, um, you had also broken down what some of these costs were, and uh, I think an interesting number there was a considerable amount is, is reputational cost, which I think is, is something that, that, again, people will go, well, you know, we, ha we had a bunch of machines infected with viruses, so we had to, you know, we had to wipe the machines, reinstall them, boot them back up. Um, you know, it didn't cost that much. But, you know, if that meant that a certain number of uh, patients uh, were delayed, a certain number of, you know, if, if, if word of that got out, you know, it is impacting our reputation. So um, it, is, it is expensive. And, it's, uh, you know, it, this is one more uh, reason to, to get, if you're, if you're having difficulty in your organization, uh, getting people's attention on, on security issues, the, these are numbers which are, I think can help. So uh, back to you, Larry. Thank you, Stephen. So uh, this is a nice easy slide on advanced persistent threats, APTs. It's an it's a incredible result. Just 26% of our respondents said that their organizations have a system and controls in place to detect and stop them. Uh, that doesn't seem like a particularly great result. What's, what do you think, Stephen? Well, I think, I think um, yeah, it, 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 it's worrying. Um, it is in a way perhaps not surprising because, you know, relative to, to other sectors, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's fair to say healthcare uh, has not matured um, as much in IT security. And so, you know, again, this, this goes back to the, the sympathy I have in this space, you know, 
if you look at telecoms or, or finance, uh, those are sectors that have had to put systems online in the face of adversity for a long period of time. Um, and so they had already gone online and done online security uh, before the rise of cybercrime, you know, uh, in which I would date back, you know, the last 10 years has been the rise of cybercrime. And so, you know, other sectors of our economy are better protected. Um, they're more aware of advanced persistent threats. And I think in, in the survey, there's some other numbers around advanced persistent threats in the healthcare space where, you know, potentially um, part of the problem is healthcare organizations not understanding what they are or realizing even that they are there. So, you know, I think it's an area where there needs to be more focus. I do think that, you know, if a healthcare organization is, is covering off the basic requirements of security, that helps reduce uh, advanced persistent threat problems. Um, but it is, you know, it, it is another level of security uh, awareness that's needed in order to, to track these down once they get into your system. So um, back to you, Larry. Thank you, sir. Here's another interesting stat. 40% or just approximately 40% of healthcare organizations said they experienced a DDoS attack that caused a disruption to operations at our system downtime. And in, in our research, by the way, Stephen, one of the things we found is um, denial of service attacks many times do not bring down a system, but they still create disruptions to ops and to, you know, and also disruption to end users. So it doesn't have to be a, like a like a complete takeover or shutdown of a data center. It could basically be uh, just an, an annoyance and maybe part of the data center, like one rack in the data center, uh, is basically turned off and you might have redundant systems. So you don't really experience downtime, but it's still costly. But 40% seems like a really high number to me. But what, what's your reaction to this? Yeah, so, th so this was one of the surprises for me. Um, and, and, you know, the, the research group here in, in San Diego that um, we just didn't expect that. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, it, it's concerning in a number of ways, one of which is the strategy we've seen in, in, in an attacks in, in other sectors where a denial of service attack I mean, and, and just to put denial of service attacks in perspective, you know, there are a number of reasons for these. You know, one is a ransom. So, you know, it's, it's not unusual for an organization that depends on revenue from its website to get a phone call saying, um, if you don't pay us X amount of money, we're going to take your uh, online store down for X amount of time, um, you know, with a denial of service attack. Some denial of service attacks are done out of anger, out of political um, uh, motivations. But... They're also being done as a cover for attacks of a different kind. And this links back really to advanced persistent threats. You know, if, if somebody wants to establish um, un unauthorized access within your system over a long period of time, that persistent threat, getting in there to do that, um, if, if a system is well protected, can be difficult. One of the ways that you can increase your chances of getting into the system is to hit it with a denial of service attack. You know, that gets people's um, attention. You know, oh, my gosh, we've got, you know, uh, all these packets coming in. We, we've, we've got to deflect the attack. And that, you know, takes the eye off, uh, off maybe the screen, which is showing other activity, much more subtle activity, which is somebody breaking into the system. So, yeah, I, th and I think it's kind of a, a certainly a wake-up call to organizations in healthcare that maybe haven't thought of themselves as potentially a target of denial of service. Clearly, um, healthcare is a denial of service uh, target now. So back to you, Larry. Thank you. Okay, looking at the time, I'm going to now talk faster. I'm going to go into my New York City mode. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so what do hackers want? What are they most interested in stealing? So we ask um, our respondents in the survey to provide kind of like their 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 maybe their best guess because they might not know with absolute certainty. But number one, as we mentioned before, that patient record is contains some very rich information uh, and, and maybe a treasure trove to bad guys. And we saw this in other pond studies as well. But also billing information, information that has maybe a copay, you might have a credit card 
or debit card on file. Uh, so that definitely is valuable. And then gen other types of information which would fall under the research or even clinical trial type data, which I suppose in the hands of a smart and clever bad guy could be very valuable. So we know that uh, I can't reveal my sources, but we know that there are pharmaceutical companies that have been attacked, um, you know, by folks who are viewed as trusted insiders uh, to steal the research data, which ended up in the hands of an unfriendly country. So these things do happen. They may not happen that frequently, but when they happen, it's a big, big deal. Any comments on this slide? Well, in, in the interest of, of time, Larry, I'll, I'll keep my comments short, but I, I, I think that you know, we've talked about the value of the patient record uh, for the criminal. But um, I, th I think that 50% number says to me, you know, if your hospital is um, involved or your clinic is involved in trials, you could be a target by somebody uh, from, uh, from somebody who's looking for that information, the intellectual property around that. Uh, and certainly if you're a research facility, yes, there are people being hired to steal certain kinds of research data. So, yeah, let's, let's move along. So the, one of the interesting areas that is kind of new news here is what are some of the biggest concerns? And just the concerns about medical device vulnerabilities. You know, so 77% said unsecured medical devices are a huge concern. But then we ask the corollary question, so what, what are you doing to deal with this problem? And only 27% said medical devices are part of their organization's security strategy. It's like viewed as something else. But they're all connected, and many of these are, in, you know, Internet-connected devices. Um, and it could also be devices, that, you know, not to be like a science fiction movie, but it could be pacemakers um, and, you know, insulin regulators, things that are actually in your body. I mean, it's kind of scary. Think about the consequences of that type of a vulnerability. Any comments? Yes, I, I, I do think this was, was an, you know, uh, a valuable finding, right? So when we when we when we put surveys out, I think in some situations, you know, we think we can predict the answers and what the numbers are going to show. Um, but this one, no. I I, I mean, I, I, you know, it's a good news, bad news. I, I was very pleased to see that medical devices were top, you know, were top of mind, um, right. and that, so there's the awareness of the of the issue. But clearly, there's a lag there in terms of the response. You know that that these uh, these concerns are not part of security strategy. Hopefully, that's changing, um, and you know, uh, will will improve over time. Um, and and just to, to sort of uh, add the one more reason for that to imp you know one reason it's got to improve over time is the uh, increasing use of these devices, whether they're consumer devices or uh, professional pro devices. Um, Clearly, there's a push to use them, and they do have tremendous uh, benefit, uh, but they need to be part of uh, and embraced by the security policies and um, strategy of the organization. So back to you, completely. Thank you. So now we're going to talk about some barriers to success. What's preventing us from having success? And poll question number three. I think we have time for oh, right. turn. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Kristen, I'll open up the... Um, the polling, because we can kind of um, we can do some interesting comparisons maybe here. So, um, yeah. what is the yeah what is the main challenge in keeping your organization's cybersecurity posture from being fully effective? Uh, lack of collaborations with other functions, insufficient staffing, ins insufficient budget, uh, not considered a priority. We should have maybe had oh, and lack of in-house expertise. We maybe should have had a, like all of the above answer as well. But um, yeah. people are voting. Uh, uh, and uh, let me get move over to the voting screen. Um, as, as, as I mentioned, uh, we can't see who you are, so please go ahead and use the voting tab. Um, not many of you have voted yet. Um, thinking about this one, actually, this is, this is actually quite a difficult question to, to answer. Maybe to think which of those is um, the main challenge. Um, so more votes coming in. Thank you for voting, audience. We appreciate it. Yes, yes. And, and by the yes, I mentioned this before. If you're watching the recording of this, you, you can't actually vote. Um, we, we had a couple of people contact us. 
<laughs> the votes will be frozen uh, in just a moment. Okay, so um, we we have kind of a clear winner here, which is C, yeah. insufficient budget. Um, and and, I, and in a way that could and I can see though that could be an umbrella from from the others. The lack of cl collaboration is is the lowest though at ten percent, which is interesting. Um, so I'll I'll advance it on to the next slide. Uh, oh, I just mentioned this that not considered a priority by management comes in as twenty six percent. So that's a bit concerning. So I'll move it on to the next slide though, and. Um, this one, Larry, what do you think? This, this is a, a couple of interesting points. Number one, about half, exactly half of our respondents said they have an incident response process in place. Obviously, if you have an incident and you don't have an incident response process, you could be in a world of hurt. I don't have to sell that to you. It's pretty obvious. And then if you do have a process, who's involved in that? Uh, now, again, I'm not saying this is the ideal state, but clearly we have information security the corporate council or, you know, the general council, compliance department, risk management, information, technology, IT organization. Sometimes an organization will have like a HIPAA or privacy office, and then security, which would be physical security because we already had information security, human resources, and other. So, uh, and we've looked at incident response as an area of, of, of great importance to security. And at general findings, it's just pretty obvious. You have a plan, that's half of it. You want to make sure the plan works, and you want to make sure you have the right people, the right team in place when, the, when an incident hits. If you don't do any of those three, you're going to probably find yourself in the world of hurt. And you know, the world of hurt could also be not just because bad guys are getting in, but also the compliance police. You know, those folks from the Office of Civil Rights and HIPAA, you know, they may show up and start wondering what's going on in your organization. So you have to be prepared. Stephen? Yeah, so so um, I'll, I, I think you you pretty much covered that, but I'll give you one one um, piece of information here. You know, I, I, the research group here, you know, when we got the results from this, I asked them them what they thought, and and Lisa Myers, who uh, is one of the researchers here who who focuses on healthcare, she, her response to that fifty percent, um, which means you know fifty percent don't have incident response processes in place. Well, that's just terrifying, <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, I shouldn't really laugh. But the th I mean, I guess the thing that that concerned me there was way before cybercrime, computer security involved incident response um, because you just don't know what's going to take down your system, and you need to be ready to respond to it. So I, yeah, I think that's kind of a wake-up call um, to 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 this sector. So um, back to you, Larry. Thank you. Many of the survey healthcare IT pros are not aware of possible risk and vulnerability. And this is another finding, an unanticipated finding in our study. It's the question mark finding because a lot of the people who responded who are IT and IT and doing IT security in their organization may not have the complete picture. Um, so that uncertainty is a, is a key research finding, um, even though it's a, and somewhat surprising at times. 39% of our respondents said they do not understand how to protect their organization against cyber attacks. I mean, it's an honest response, but it's kind of a scary response if their job is IT security. Comment on this, Stephen? Um, actually, Larry, can you go to the next slide? Um, because I think this sure. th this breaks it down yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, this is good. thank you for suggesting that. So let's look at 29%. They are unsure if employee negligence affects their organization security posture. That's pretty surprising. 27% are unsure if cyber attacks have evaded their intrusion prevention or detection systems. 26% are unsure if their organization has experienced an incident involving the loss of patient data, PHI. So, again, that's that unsure response. That's pretty significant, I think. As a researcher, you normally don't see such a high percentage of uncertainty. Well, yes, and, and I, I, I think, Larry, that, you know, there could be a couple of things happening here. I, I think I certainly do thank everybody for their honesty in responding to this. Um, sure. You know, 
and, 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 and speaking up. And it, it may be that in other sectors, when we survey on this, this topic, you know, people have learned not to admit that they don't know, but, uh, or they're not sure. Uh, but it is, it's concerning. And, and I think, again, it, it reflects this, what one might call lack of maturity in the space. Um, you know, that, that, that there hasn't been that much, uh, valuable data that bad guys can go after in the past. You know, certainly 10 years ago, far less medical data was, was accessible via Internet attacks and network attacks. And so, yeah, the, it, I think it reflects the need to mature very quickly in this area and, and get a grip on, on some of these issues. So, Larry? I agree. So here's another um, interesting graph. It's a lack of budget allocation. I think the the main meaning here. So the budget that we're looking at is the budget dedicated to IT security. So it's a percentage of the IT budget that's focused on security related issues. And you'll see that you don't see a high percentages here. It's hard to know what the ideal number is, but in some industries like financial services, it could be north of 20%. Um, in other industries like healthcare, if you took an extrapolated average, it's somewhere between 5 and 10%. And again, one could make the argument that security issues are equal. Or in fact, in some cases, security or insecurity in healthcare is significant. But it is definitely uh, an interesting finding that, and this is consistent with our audience in the last poll, where I think the number one response as a barrier was lack of budget. And this is, I think, evidence of that. Stephen? Yep, I, I I think so, Larry. I, I think that you know when when <laughs> when the federal government uh, was was trying to stimulate the economy with all of those funds to uh, digitize health records and create the electronic health record, it should have come with a great big or a much bigger warning sign than it did, that you're going to have to spend quite a lot of this money on protecting that data. Uh, right. And, and that the, the need to spend more money in this space at this point in time, I think, I think is clear. So um, let's see. I'll advance to the next slide, if that's okay with you, Larry, because okay. this is... This is solutions, right? So um, in the interest of time and taking questions from, um, from the audience, I'm going to cover this one fairly quickly. Um, Great. Because obviously there's a huge amount uh, uh, of information out there about how to do security uh, in general and in, in healthcare. You know, and the HIMSS organization has tremendous documentation on, on how to do healthcare IT security. The point of, of this picture here is that, you know, these are the four things that, that you really have to be doing and doing them well. Um, you know, the, the, and it sounds very basic, but if you look at what is clearly the top of mind concern right now, ransomware, backup is your number one protection or your, certainly your, your strongest protection against ransomware. If you have your backup and recovery systems up and running properly and somebody encrypts your files and demands a ransom um, and you've got all the files available in your backup, you're in a much, much better position. Um, and you should be doing backup for every kind of uh, problem that come up there. You know, if, you have, if there's an earthquake, if there's a fire, if there, whatever situation your systems are faced with, with threats, backup is, is your last and best line of defense. Encryption is clearly uh, required under various interpretations of the regulations, and encryption can actually get you uh, a free pass with some of the reporting requirements under HIPAA breach reporting. Um, Anti-malware clearly is, is you know, a strong line of defense against ransomware and all those other web-borne malicious code attacks. The thing with anti-malware is it has to be in place and on all systems, not just endpoints, but also servers, and it has to be properly managed. Um, one of the biggest problems we see with anti-malware is that somebody turns it off somewhere for some reason, and you know, IT security doesn't see that it's been turned off and doesn't get it turned back on in time, and there's an infection. Uh, and as they say, it, it only takes one. And then strong authentication. You know, it, the password-based access is just not strong enough these days, and two-factor authentication, uh, there's various forms of that, but that needs to be in place. And these are not just necessary to protect your systems. These are going to be a line of defense if you're in the dock, if you're reported for um, some security breach, 
having the if you don't have these four in place, then you're not going to be uh, doing well. Your, people will say, well, you didn't follow the standard of due care in protecting your information. So just a shout out to what I call the four pillars of security. And um, at this point, I think we can turn it back to Kristen. Great. Well, great. thank you so much, Larry and Stephen. That was a lot of great information, and I want to make sure we do take some of these questions that people are writing in right now. So it looks like we've already got a bunch of them in there. So as a reminder to the audience, please enter your questions on the Bright Talk screen for the Q&A session. And for more information on this report, um, the topics we talked about today, please look at the Attachments tab at the top. And before we do the Q&A, um, we have one last polling question. So feel free to answer this at any time during the rest of the presentation, so you don't have to do it right now, but any time during the rest of the presentation, if you'd like access to one of the following, a contact from ESET Sales, a custom uh, business edition trial of ESET software, which includes a remote administrator, a product demo, uh, information on becoming a reseller partner or MSP, and of course, you know, you can always request none of the above. Um, and at this point, um, I am going to turn it back over to you, Stephen. I see a bunch of questions in there, so let's get started on those and make sure we answer everyone's questions. Well, I'm in the time available. I'm not sure if we can do everyone, but uh, the first one I think is a quick one for you, Larry. Um, somebody Great. wanted you to repeat the percentage of IT budget uh, dedicated to security in other industries. So, number one, as a research uh, company, we have collected lots of data about the about budgeting in the IT security space. And so there is quite a bit of variance based on industry or vertical. Um, in healthcare, we are on average looking at a, the, the, the percentage of IT security to uh, the total IT budget is somewhere between 5 and 10 percent. And it does vary based on um, many factors, but specifically, that tends to be lower than other industries. Financial services, in comparison, it could be as much as 20%, especially in the retail banking space. So, uh, obviously, uh, 5 to 10 versus 20 more more percentage point makes a big difference. Um, and we basically see this pretty consistently among healthcare organizations that are providers and even business health organizations that are, you know, in, that are business associates and primarily. Yeah, I think I think you know, to me. That that is a great concern because the you know a lot of financial information can, and, and, and attacks on financial information can be hedged. Um, you know, money can be uh, insured. Um, the right. exposure you know in, in healthcare uh, and what can go wrong with healthcare data breaches is, is, is potentially much worse. Um, another question here: um, Is everyone aware that many types of ransomware attacks have no reporting requirement under HIPAA? Um, that's a very good point, um, and, yeah. and I've actually talked to a couple of people, uh, security researchers, who think that maybe this is this is one of the reasons, um, you know, it, it's becoming popular because, you know, so much of healthcare IT security has been compliance driven, focused on meeting HIPAA requirements, and and it's it's a fascinating question, you know, the. the Ransomware means that somebody's got at your data, but it means they've hidden the data. They haven't exposed the data. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, regardless of whether you're, you've got a HIPAA problem, you definitely have a problem if you're here with ransomware. So, yeah, it's very important to protect against it. Um, a question here, uh, did, uh, did the surveys uncover any conflict between the physician class of needs versus the recommendations of IT security staff? Um, you know, is, is there a, a variance between the you know, hospital administrators who, who uh, are listening to phys physician system access needs versus IT security control needs? Um, I, I think. One of the numbers in the in the survey, and you can maybe speak to this from other surveys you've done, Larry, but one of the numbers yeah. in our survey showed that there were issues around co cooperation between different departments was definitely shown, right. showed up as a barrier to, to security. But uh, what about other surveys? Yeah, so it, it's a very astute, very good question. One of the findings of our research in healthcare is that there is a gap uh, between 
the people who are providing medical services, the clinicians and specifically doctors, um, MDs, uh, and basically the folks who are, who are responsible for IT and IT security. Uh, a lot of physicians feel like their time is very valuable, and actually it is. I mean, they don't want to do things like, you know, use a password or even a biometric on their on their uh, mobile device, and which can, if it, and, it, and if, because these devices are connected to potentially some large databases, it, it becomes very, very risky. So we see a lot of pushback on the security paradigm in healthcare that we don't see in other uh, industries in the same way. So a good question, and if you want more information, contact Bonneman Institute. We'd love to talk to you more about uh, about some of the gaps that we've identified. Okay, so um, I can actually answer this one. What size of healthcare organizations were surveyed? Um, these were, most of them, if I'm right, uh, Larry, were between 100 and 500 employees. Is that? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we use employees okay. rather than beds because 64% were covered entities primarily, and the remainder were biz classified as business associates. But in reality, a lot of companies are both CEs and BAs. So we basically used our own judgment to sort them into one of those two categories. Okay, a couple of quick questions which I think I can handle. Um, are there incident response plan templates? Uh, there are. Um, I think you need, you know, I can't give you um, URLs off the top of my head, but certainly, um, you will find some out there if you Google. And one of the things, one of the areas that I found is that un a lot of universities publish all of their, um, you know, security uh, policies and, and uh, strategies online. So there are some out there. Um, it's an area that I think we, we could, uh, at least we could maybe look at uh, helping out with in, in getting some of those things together. Um, uh, Another one is how far behind is healthcare from other industries as it comes to security? I think I think I'm actually going to we're going to pass on that one because it's it's very hard to quantify. I will say that I've spoken to to some organizations in healthcare that are really really good on security. You know, they they've taken it on board. Um, they're they're ticking all the boxes and not just ticking the boxes, but but take, you know to comply. But they've got very proactive programs. Um, and, and I think you know we, we shouldn't uh, you know we shouldn't avoid that or, or, or shouldn't uh, neglect mentioning uh, them. And, and I think actually we, what will happen at the top of the hour is this system will close down. So I'm going to, to um, turn it back over to Kristen. But first of all, thank you, Larry, very very much for participating in this. I, I really valued your input. And Ditto. I really enjoyed presenting with you, Stephen. Thank you, and thank you, audience, for your interest. Great, and thank you both. I know that was a lot of great information, and if we didn't get to your question, we will make sure to get to get to your question and um, follow up with you via email or another channel. So thank you again for your participation in today's webcast. We hope that you found it valuable. As a reminder, you can rate this webcast or share it through your social media channels in your Bright Talk window. And again, for more information on ESET Endpoint Security products, you can go to ESET.com for more information on this report. And other things, you can go to the Attachments tab. Thank you. And that's our webcast for the day.